spirit of offense. Yeah, so I'm going to share screen now. So it's about the spirit of offense that is always used by Satan, that is always used by the enemy to trap us. It happens very easily. And most of the time, it happens to us as leaders. Whether you are in the church as a pastor, evangelist, missionary, or whether you are in the marketplace as a leader in the corporate world, or you are working in the offices with your superiors and all, this is a trap that the enemy loves to use, create offense. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, the writer of Hebrews says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. Our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, sees everything, including the thing that is hidden in your heart. That is why in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, this, the writer of Proverbs says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all else. Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, of course we know the armor of God, but in Ephesians 6, chapter 14, he says, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belts of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is put on our chest area for one thing, to guard our hearts, so that our hearts and our walk will always be walking in the righteousness of God. That is our responsibility to put on that piece of armor, the breastplate of righteousness to guard our own heart. Now I'm going to share three areas or three seeds that the enemy loves to sow to create offense so that we ourselves especially when we are leaders called by God, we will stop the relationship with someone because I am offended. So the first thing that the enemy loves to use is this sense of justice that we always have. So for this one, we can look at the story of Pama, Amnon, and Absalom. So this story can be found in 2 Samuel chapter 13. I'm not going to run through the scriptures, but generally, in a nutshell, you know the story. You know that Tama, she was a beautiful woman, and Amnon, her half-brother, like her. So Amnon devised plan to get close to Tama, and when he was able to, he, he actually raped Tama. And the Bible told us, after he had raped Tama, Amnon became disgusted by Tama and he chased her away without giving her a proper marriage. So this story didn't end there. Now Tama cried running to her brother Absalom. Absalom knew what happened because the, story, the Bible told us that Tama tore her clothes, put on ashes. And then during that time, what did Absalom do? Absalom kept quiet and told Tama to stay in his house. He protected his sister. But the father, David, did nothing about it. So Absalom later found that it was his right to defend his sister. Absalom had a sense of justice to do what is right. What do we see here? What can we learn from here? First, an unfulfilled desire that Amnon had. The unfulfilled desire that Amnon had had turned his love into hatred. So Amnon hated Tama. And the next thing that we learn from this story also is from Absalom's decision. Absalom felt that he had the right, he had a sense of justice 
to avenge an offense that had been done to the family. The offense was done by Amnon towards Tamar. Now the big brother Absalom felt that he had the rights, he had the sense of justice to avenge, to take revenge, to revenge that offense. And David, King David, as the father of all these three persons, he knew the offense that was done, but he didn't do a single thing about it. It was an unresolved offense that was festering in the family, and this unresolved offense escalated into a murder in the family. Of course, you know the story. Absalom plotted a scheme, and he killed Amnon. Now, the second seed that the devil always loved to sow to create offense is the misplaced entitlement. A misplaced entitlement. I am entitled to this because of my position as the eldest daughter in a family. I am entitled to all this respect from my people because I am the president of this association. I am entitled to receive accolades, to receive honor from my people because of my achievements. Entitlements. When there is a misplaced entitlement, there can be offenses. For this, we are going to look into the leadership of Moses. And for this, we are going to look into the book of Numbers. First thing of all is from Numbers chapter 12. Who are the ones who had opinion about Moses? His own sister, Miriam. His own brother, Aaron. The prophetess and the prophet, yeah? The mouthpiece of God. What happened? They criticized Moses. Why? Because they had opinion about the woman whom he married, a Cushite woman. They said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? But the Lord heard them. Now, what did Moses do? Moses didn't do anything at all. Moses, according to the Bible, in a subsequent verse, verse 3, Moses was very humble. He was more humble than any other person on earth. And of course, the Lord came down and he judged Miriam. Of course, we know the story, Miriam's skin turned leprosy. He, she started to have leprosy on her skin and she was put outside the camp of Israelis until she was cleared of it. This was an offense that had been taken to challenge the leadership by the persons who were the two persons who were the closest to Moses, his own sister, his own brother. When the enemy wants to attack you as a leader, who will he use? He used the person closest to you. He used your wife. He used your husband. He used the one whom you trusted so much in your church, in your office. He used the one whom you confided in. And then he will create an offense. And when the offense happened, there will be a break in the relationship, a break in the trust, a break in the whole cooperation. Now, the second story from the leadership of Moses here, we can see from Numbers chapter 16. Who were the ones who had opinion about Moses now? The priests, Korah, son of Isa, and the sons of Kohat, son of Levi, conspired with Datan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, from the tribe of Reuben. These were the people who were close to leading the people yeah, to worship the Lord, to sing songs of praise and all, they incited a rebellion against Moses. They started, they stirred up rebellion against Moses, against the leadership of Moses, along with 250 other leaders of the community. All of them 
prominent members of the assembly. And in verse 3, it says what? They united against Moses and Aaron and said, you have gone too far. The whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord and he is with all of us. What right do you have to act as though you are greater than the rest of the Lord's people? This was the challenge against the leadership of Moses. And what did Moses and Aaron do? Moses and Aaron didn't defend themselves. Instead, they prayed to the Lord. They handed over the situation to the Lord. And then, of course, we know the story. The ground opened up. The Lord judged the people who started the rebellion. The sons of Korah, Kotab, and all the rest, they were swallowed into the ground. That very day itself. So as a leader, from the Bible here, you can see the stories of Moses. You should expect offense to come. When you are a leader, called by God, appointed by God, anointed by God, equipped by God, know this one thing. There will be offenses. There will be offenses. But what do you do? Remember your calling. Remember very well who called you and who put you into this position of leadership. And your job is to answer to the one who called you and to keep your eyes focused on the one who called you. And he will do the rest for you. Reasons why? Because he is the one. He is the author of your life. And he is the one who has called you into this position to fulfill his plan. So keep your eyes trained on Jesus. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ and run your race faithfully. Remember who called you and remember what he has called you for. And as what Joshua has told his assembly, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Didn't Jesus tell us this as well? When he gave the great commission, he also said, No, I will be with you to the end of the earth. So make sure that you are doing what the Lord has appointed you to do in this season of your life, in this particular calling of your life. And do it well, keeping your eyes faithfully onto him. And he is the one who will go with you until the end of the earth. So if you are finding difficulties in doing evangelism, if you are finding difficulties in the position of leadership, if you are finding the people that you are leading keep giving you offenses, keep causing you a lot of issues, be encouraged tonight, brothers and sisters. Be strong and be courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. Now, the third seed that the enemy loves to do is to create a mismatch expectation. Now, the Bible tells us that the Jewish people, they had an expectation of the Messiah. When Jesus came, they had an expectation that the Messiah, he would overthrow the Roman government. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't do that at all. So now we are going to look into when there was a mismatch of expectation, what happened to the people who were offended by Jesus? We are going to look into Matthew chapter 13 in verses 55 to 56. These were the people who knew Jesus when he was a child. They said, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? In other words, 
how could this person whom we know had all this thing? It's impossible that he knew all this thing because we were with him when he grew up. So this was the challenge to the call of Jesus. Now, in the subsequent verse, the Bible tells us very clearly here, so they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and is in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So the people in his hometown were offended by Jesus because they had an idea of who Jesus was. When Jesus was growing up with them, they knew Jesus. They knew the mother. They knew the sisters. They knew the brothers. So how could Jesus now suddenly perform all these miracles? So because of the concept or the idea of who Jesus was, clash with what they see now of what Jesus could do. They couldn't accept what Jesus could do. They took offense against Jesus. They were offended at him. The Bible tells us very clearly here. And because of the offense against Jesus, what happened? They reject Jesus. They had unbelief. And because of that, Jesus did not do many mighty works in his hometown. So how did this happen? First, there is a preconceived notion, an idea that has been hatched in the minds of the people, a preconceived notion, an idea, a concept, an image that they have formed in their mind because I know the person. So I have this idea about him or her. And because of the preconceived notion, which is now being challenged by the reality or by a new idea. The reality is Jesus could perform miracles. How can that be? So when they are challenged, they have to make a decision whether they want to accept the new idea or they want to fall back to their preconceived notion. If they fall back to their preconceived notion, then they will take offense, which happened in this story, in this case here. The people in the hometown of Jesus took offense against the miracles of Jesus. They took offense against Jesus. And the Bible tells us the reason for their offense was unbelief. It was unbelief. So the offense led to unbelief. So they started to reject the miracles of Jesus. And because of that, there was no miracles happening. So sometimes when we as a leader, we have to understand that if let's say we are coming in with a new idea to present to the people and the people cannot follow us because they couldn't accept this new idea, then there can be an offense that happened. So we need to be aware of that. And if let's say we are at the receiving end of a new idea brought up by a young emerging leader in our church, in our offices, in our workplace, in our mission field, suddenly a young punk comes up and says, I know how to do this better. And he gives a new idea. Ah, the person is challenging my idea now, my preconceived notion. So what can happen now? Do I accept the person's idea or do I do not want to accept the person's idea? If I do not accept the person's idea, am I going into an offense? We have to always check our spirit, check our heart. Now, how do we know whether an offense has taken place? The Bible tells us in all these situations that happen, mumblings and grumblings. Mumblings and grumblings, these are the signs that an offense has taken place. So when you start to grumble, you know, when you start to grumble against your new leader that's coming up in your church or offices, yeah, when you start to grumble against a person, when you start to always criticize a person, when you start to always feel pain whenever the person says something, you might be having an offense. Do a self-check, yeah? The spirit of offense happens subtly, but this spirit of offense is both dangerous and fatal. It is lethal. 
That's why the enemy loves to use this spirit of offense. Now, when there is an offense against me, against me as a leader, what do I do? First thing I have to do is I have to acknowledge that I am hurting. I am hurting. I have to acknowledge my feeling. I have to recognize that it's not my brother, not my sister who is actually hurting, but it's me. It's me, oh Lord. I am the one who is hurting right now. You know, like for example, if I say the Lord asked me to give this handphone to him, I can see the shape of my handphone. I can feel it. I can touch it. There, is, there are borders for this handphone and I can surrender this handphone to the Lord if I say he wants the handphone because I can see how big and how small or how small is my handphone. I can surrender this thing. It is a tangible item that I can hand over. Why is it so hard for us to actually hand over our feeling, our hurt to the Lord? Because we can't see it. We can't see it with our eyes. We can only feel it. We can only feel the pain. We can only feel the hurt. So we can't really feel it. I mean, we can't really see it, sorry. Yeah, so when we can't really see it, what do we do? We have to isolate that feeling. We have to recognize that this is my feeling. We have to take ownership of that feeling that I am the one who is hurting. I am the one who is now feeling this pain. I am the one who is having offense against my brother or my sister. I have to acknowledge my feeling, take ownership of that feeling. And after I have taken over the ownership of that feeling, I can now hand over this feeling of hurt to the Lord. I can now put it into a tangible isolated item, yeah, although I can't see it, but at least I now recognize it. It becomes tangible in my heart. I can now hand over this hurt to the Lord. I can now do the handing over prayer. I can now surrender this hurt to him. And when we do that, then the Lord will come in and heal us because I'm the one who is hurting. My good shepherd will not leave me. My good shepherd will come and tend to my wound, tend to my hurts. My good shepherd will come and apply the balm of Gilead on my wound. And he will be there to heal me, to touch me, and to allow me to recover, to be healed completely. So when there is an offense against me, against you, first thing of all, Acknowledge that it's not someone else who is hurting. That Acknowledge that you are the one who is hurting. Acknowledge that one that the feeling is yours. You are the one who is facing that situation. You are the one who needs to hand over the hurt feeling. Surrender the hurt feeling to the Lord. Because in the Bible, in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the Bible tells us this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart, our heart, our heart. And in the subsequent verse, the Bible says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his doings. I, the Lord, search the heart. Your God cares for you. Your God knows that you're hurting. Your God searches your heart. Your God wants to heal you. So don't hold that grudges anymore, but hand over that hurt feeling to him to the Lord himself, and he will heal you. And once again, Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, Guard your heart, brothers and sisters. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart. 
because from your heart here, the rivers of life will flow. Because from your heart here, the Lord who is the Alpha and the Omega, who is your good shepherd, he is able to do mighty works through you when you put your heart in alignment with God, in unity with Christ, then you will see the miracles, the signs, the wonders that can happen through your hands. So brothers and sisters, I pray that this will be an encouragement to you that when you are in the mission field, when you are doing the work of the Lord, that you will continue to guard your hearts and to continue to move on and march on to do the things of God and to always remember that Jesus Christ loves you and he is your good shepherd. And when you are called by the Lord to be the leader, don't give up too easily. Hang on there and you can do mighty work. Amen. Because he is the one who enables you. He is the one who loves you. He is the one who sees your future, not your friends, not the one who is the closest to you, but your Lord, your master sees your future. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise be to the Lord.